Welcome back. I have Brad Stolberg joining me on the podcast on a Halloween episode. Uh, Brad, uh, thanks so much for uh, taking some time to chat. Thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to this. Of course. Um, so the first question of this podcast is always a tough one. Uh, and the question is, who is Brad? Oh, man. Wow. You don't mess around. <laughs> so um, who is Brad? I'll start Brad in this moment is uh, an author that is interested in the evidence-based principles of sustainable excellence. Brad is a performance coach to a mix of entrepreneurs, physicians, and business professionals. Um, Brad is a very armchair strength and conditioning athlete. And most important, Brad is a partner to Caitlin and a dad to Theo. Awesome. I love, I love how you frame that. I love the pursuit. Um, I love your pursuit of, of knowledge and information and cutting through, cutting through the noise. Uh, for those that, that don't follow Brad on Twitter, he's, um, he's very good at doing that. We have a lot of people that like to, to tell people that they're smart. And then there are a lot of people or a smaller population of people that, that show that they have a lot of experience and, and have learned a lot of things, both evidence-based and um, evidence-based as, as, uh, as it is with you. So let's paint the picture of Brad, Brad, the human, before we dive further into Brad, the, um, in the pursuit of excellence and um, consistency over intensity uh, as, as your hat says. So where did your, where did your fascination with uh, the pursuit of getting better uh, come from? You know, I've probably always had it in me. I was raised in a household where for better and for worse, um, my parents pushed me. And um, I think that I was rewarded for doing well. So I was probably always looking for ways to, to do well. Um, and then it really blossomed when I was in graduate school. I went to the University of Michigan's Graduate School of Public Health. And um, a couple of things happened in tandem there. The first is that I realized just how focused the United States healthcare system is on sick care and on disease, which is very different than, excuse me, very different than health and flourishing. Right. And um, I kind of wanted to look the other way, both at the time from an intellectually curious standpoint, I was much more interested in, in flourishing than disease, but also just simply as like a savvy economic thinker. I'm like, well, if everyone's focused on disease, it's probably easier to make a name for yourself if you focus on health. Um, and this is years ago before, you know, the health and wellness trend emerged. Um, at the same time, I was getting really into endurance sports back then. And I was putting in really big training weeks. And um, I think a mix of like the performance mindedness that came from sport and then living in this intellectual world that was all about public health, how I started to merge them in my own mind and in my own story was that we often think of disease when we talk about health, and I would rather actually talk about health and flourishing. And then when we talk about performance, we often, some for some reason, we silo off like how we feel. So now, you know, years and years later, I've refined it, but I'm really interested in like what it takes to feel good and do good. And those two things go hand in hand. And if you're feeling good and doing good, then you're probably living a pretty fulfilled life. And when you get sick, we're really fortunate that the sick care system is there for you. Um, but my interest is upstream of that. I love that. Um, in my day job, we say that good health is not just the absence of disease, but the the striving for uh, progress and, and getting better. And um, I, moved to, I moved to Boulder a year and a half ago at this point. And one of the things that I've found to be so fascinating about the people that are here that I wish more people had uh is that like stasis is the enemy and it's mm. it's not good enough to just exist uh 
for many, that's a great goal. But um, for for myself and I think our community, it's this process of of betterment and avoiding a degradation or avoiding um, getting you know worse or not as healthy over time. And it's unfortunate how unique that is, right? It's like crazy that that we have to like step back and think about how unique it is that wow, you're actually thinking about improving. Cool. That that's that's an attractive quality, um, and this process of of amplifying the voices of people who are in this pursuit of excellence has been really fun, and I've learned a whole lot um, through it. And this episode is, I guess, formally celebrating a, a million downloads. And I wanna I wanna run some of these learnings by you in, in this process, in this conversation, as we talked about um, before we started recording, but um, maybe let's, let's keep it all, all about you for now, at least. Um, I'm curious as you, as you had this realization when you're at Michigan and beyond, um, wh- like what, what was the next step? How did you, how did you turn that realization into, okay, Here's my here's my ability to actually have an impact. What what happened next? Yeah, well, it, it was a pretty circuitous path to where I am now from where I was when those ideas were first forming. I will say that in graduate school, I also started a blog. And this was like before social media or maybe right at the inception of social media. So blogging was the thing. So it was like, you know, the, the internet 1.0, or I guess if 1.0 is AOL and 1.5 is blogosphere, I was, I was in the blogosphere. Uh, no one really read my blog, but it did get me into a regular groove of writing and it kept me into a regular groove of writing. And at the time, my blog was focused on a mix of endurance sport performance and then also public health and, and health related issues. Uh, following graduate school, I took a job at a large healthcare system out in Northern California. And the role as described was really a consulting role. So to consult to the medical group about how they could build a better organization, um, which was neat. And that was the kind of work that I had done after undergraduate school as well. Um, and when I grooved in, I realized that I really wanted to keep writing at the same time. So as a, I don't know, how old was I? 26, 27 year old, I tried to make sure that my role on projects was always the storyteller. So whether that was writing the memo or the white paper or even writing the PowerPoint slide deck, I was always writing. And then I kept up this side gig or side hustle at the time of just writing for fun. And um, I pitched a few op-eds very naively to large newspapers, and fortunately, a a, a couple of those got placed. And um, a couple of them ran on the weekend and had quite high readership. And then suddenly, I was starting to get emails from random websites asking me if I wanted to write for them. And I just said, yes, I wasn't getting paid. I thought this was the coolest thing ever. Now, if like the Huffington Post were to reach out to me and say, write an unpaid blog, I think it's offensive. But back then... Um, I was just thrilled that anyone wanted me to, to write and anyone wanted to read my writing. So it really was just a hobby um, for a couple of years. And then as I continued to refine my writing and my readership continued to grow, I started having opportunities um, to be compensated for writing. And then very gradually over a five-year period, uh, the proportion of how I spent my time and where I earned my income shifted from being this performance improvement consultant in a large healthcare system to being a writer. And eventually, the scales tipped to the point where I felt comfortable just being a writer. And then from that emerged um, a little boutique coaching practice, uh, which is really just born out of many people had read my first book, Peak Performance, which I co-authored with Steve Magnus, and started asking if I coached them. And not coach them as in write their running or strength program, but coach them as in mental skills and performance. Um, and I just said, you know, honestly, I don't really know what it means to be a performance coach. Again, this is like 10 years ago or a little bit less than 10 years ago. when Performance coaching wasn't that big of a thing. Um, so just started doing it for free for a lot of people and got good feedback. And then coaching kind of emerged. So 
you know, it's funny because I'm just having this thought now for the first time. I think it's, it, I got fortunate in the sense that I was kind of on like the, the forefront of the blogosphere, the forefront of thinking of health beyond just healthcare, and also in a way on the forefront of performance coaching. Um, I don't think I have anything to do with how the internet evolved. I don't think I have anything to do with how performance coaching evolved. I'd like to think that some of my work has actually contributed to this shift away from just the absence of disease towards what it means to be healthy. And of course, as you know, from following me on Twitter, the unfortunate externality of that is we've got literally millions of grifters selling quote unquote wellness as a result. Yes. (laughs) I mean, the sad reality of it is, and and I say this work as someone who works at a for-profit company focused on improving health span and, and longevity. But the, the sad reality is that the fundamentals don't sell, right? If you eat well, sleep well, move well, you can do that without a whole lot of products fundamentally. And so we've seen the development of crazy diets and products and um, footwear and like all of this stuff that is meant to enhance our ability to move, eat, sleep, um, impacting like what your hat says. (laughs) And uh, which is consistency over intensity. Um, which I love and I will be buying. Um, and, and I used to say that whoever figures out how to make sleep sexy is going to win and like make a lot of money. And now it's like, it's happening. You have mattress companies, you have all like pillow companies, you have all of these, uh, sleep trackers and whatnot, all gamifying, either gamifying or productizing, commodifying something that like is so incredibly boring that is a fundamental pillar to endurance or or to performance and health. Yeah. And I think that the irony is that um, there's some pretty good research that shows that with this focus on sleep, sleep quality has suffered. And the more that someone is focused on optimizing their sleep, the worse their sleep gets. Now, These studies look at large numbers, so it's on average. Some people probably benefit a lot from having a whoop or an aura ring or a special mattress, whatever it is. But on average, a lot of people, their sleep deteriorates. And my hypothesis for why this happens is really quite simple. If you turn sleep into something that you need to perform and do well at, it's kind of like the whole opposite of sleep, right? Sleep is supposed to be about shutting down to rest, to recovery. you know, you don't strive into sleep, you fall into sleep, like you fall asleep. And I think that a lot of these gadgets for a lot of people, um, they, they turn sleep into just another thing to excel at, which of course then brings on all kinds of nerves about sleep. And as anyone who's ever had any bout of poor sleep knows, the more you think about if you're going to fall asleep or not, the less likely you are to fall asleep. And then it's 4 a.m. and you're like, damn it, my alarm's going off. And everyone's had that experience before a marathon, but same thing, right? Before a marathon, you're like, oh my gosh, like I got to get sleep sleep to set up my race. And then you don't. And you can still run really well. The body can do fine on on a night or two of poor sleep. But I think when you put on all these devices, if you like are the kind of person that really obsesses about it, then every night is kind of like that marathon feel like I must sleep to get the right recovery score or, or whatever it is. Totally. I think we can learn a lot from what's going on right over here with with sleep. Who's that? That's Alfie. He's nice. he's snoozing like snoozing like a champ right now. Um, he's a better role model than my dog. My dog <laughs> sleeps with like one eye open because he's a two year old German Shepherd. And he's like must watch the front door for the male person. <laughs> he had uh, he had quite a day of exercise yesterday. He's he's eight, almost nine years old, and. Uh, and he loves he loves hiking he loves running but he he did a lot yesterday and now he's exhausted which is the principle of train rest repeat <laughs> he's thriving. yeah and he, I noticed he doesn't have nine gadgets hooked up to his uh, his paws 
you can't see his his paws. He's got he's got an Apple Watch and a Fitbit on each one. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, let's let's rewind quite a few years. What did um, what did young Brad want to be when he grew up? Believe it or not, I wanted to be a writer. So okay. I wrote for the school newspaper. Well, before that, I wanted to be a pro athlete. And in high school, I realized that I wasn't going to be a pro athlete. I was a good high school athlete, but it became very clear I wasn't going to be a pro athlete. Uh, and then I wanted to be a writer. So I, I wrote for the school newspaper. I was really involved with the school newspaper in undergraduate school. Um, but I also, as the pragmatist in me said, oh, you can't make a living as a writer, so I better go get a quote-unquote real job. Um, I also, going back to high school, I applied to the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern, which is like the foremost prestigious journalism school in America. And I got rejected. And like most 17-year-olds, I said, all right, like, guess I'm not going to be a writer. I'll go to another school and study economics or psychology, whatever it is. And that's precisely what I did. So I always wanted to do it. And... I had these false starts or at least these moments where I'm like, oh, guess I'm not going to be a writer. Guess I'm not going to be a writer. But in hindsight, I was always writing. So as I mentioned, like even in these non-writing jobs, I was always the person that was doing the storytelling. Um, I worked at McKinsey and Company for two years and I was never the person running the financial model. I was always the person making the PowerPoint slides. So looking back, it's pretty cogent. Like, oh yeah, you, you told, you told nonfiction stories, but that's only in, in the rear view mirror. At the time, I wasn't like, oh, I'm going to do this so I can learn how to write nonfiction. No, I was doing it because it's what I enjoyed doing and what I was decent at. That makes sense. And fast forward a few years, and we've all learned a lot from, from your learnings. So peak for, was Peak Performance your, your first book? Yeah, that was the first book. Where did the, where did the idea for that come from? You know, it, it came from a lot of training in endurance sports, my own training, and seeing that so many of the principles that good endurance athletes follow actually make a lot of sense for just everyone to perform their best in whatever it is they do. Whether it's creative work like this, whether it's trying to manage a team, whether it's parenting, you name it. And... Um, Looking into the research, it became really clear that actually these different academic silos called these concepts different things, but the actual concepts are the same. So whether it's like deliberate practice in music or periodization in sport or um, incubation in creativity... These different scholars that weren't talking to each other all had their own frameworks that were basically the same thing, um, which is you stress a system, you challenge it, you allow it to rest and recover, and then it grows. You have to have the optimal dose of stress and the optimal dose of rest. And it's constantly uh, adaptive, moving target over time. And um, that was really the, the kernel that became peak performance. I co-authored it with Steve Magnus, who really has become a collaborative partner in just about everything that I do. And um, the story there is actually, it's pretty funny. I'd known Steve for a while because we're both interested in these similar things, but we never met in person. And I guess I developed enough trust with him where I felt comfortable sharing this idea that I had for a book and, and asking his opinion on it. And um, he responded to my email within like a minute saying, you're not going to believe me, but I've been thinking the exact same thing. And here's a hundred pages of notes to prove it. So like, here are all my cards on the table. I'm not just making this up to steal your idea. And, you know, there's probably like 70% overlap in how we were thinking about this. So um, we got on the phone and we said, it probably doesn't make sense to do this separately. Let's try to do it together. And at the time, neither of us had huge platforms. So there was also like a real business reason to do it together. But I'm so glad that I did because um, now Steve and I work together on all sorts of projects and it's, it's a lot less lonely as a writer that way. What was the most surprising thing that you learned from Steve? I think just how disheveled and unorganized someone can be and still be a phenomenal performer. <laughs> so Steve and I are like polar Hey, opposites. I represent that comment. <laughs> 
Steve and I are polar opposites in this regard. So I am very um, plan driven and I will spend extra time editing, proofreading, just meticulous about quality to a point where it, it probably is a net harm on my work and, and how I spend my time. Whereas Steve's the total opposite. Steve's like, ship it, ship it, ship it. Oh, we don't need to schedule it. I'll just text you. You know, Steve comes in to record a podcast and he's got like one foot still at the door from his run. He grabs his microphone. Um, whereas I like prep for a half an hour, get my like notes ready. So we're just very different in that way. And I think what makes our partnership work is we don't kill each other about it. And we remember more than we forget that it is actually the fact that we both exist on these extremes that makes us a pretty good team because we find a happy middle. I, I love that. Um, I brought someone on to help support the podcast um, at the end of January. And uh, her name is Emily. She's incredible at what she does and she's so organized and so detail oriented and I'm the complete opposite. I just want to create stuff and ship it. As you said, like I don't prep for interviews. I, I don't do, I'm very not type a, like I just want to have uh, an awesome conversation with good people and like let other people who are great at, at what they do figure out all the rest but the the merging of like that creative side with someone who is incredibly structured and detail oriented i think is a perfect overlap right because you have two people who are very good at very different things and then there's no like there's no stepping on toes when it comes to different pieces of the puzzle right you, you get to a point where you just like i have no interest in 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 that side of things and right. you have no interest in this side of things and it's in the overlap there's more overlap than than i make it sound like right because we've also right. both written uh books on our own solo books and in right. both of those books i'd like to think are really good I, i'm obviously biased but um they're really good books so can we both do stuff on our own and do it well absolutely good. sure um do we have much more fun as a team 100 percent. so what i love about your realizations from peak performance around like you have all of these different arenas where the same principles apply. I've found in my 10 ish years in working in for companies that dabble or you're either very heavily involved in the endurance space to some capacity that it's for this reason that endurance athletes tend to make really excellent employees because they they get the practice of the process and they get the practice of like brick by brick by brick. I've only ever worked at startups in my career. So this is slightly uh, a jaded perspective or a slightly biased perspective. But my, my opinion on the matter is that um, this like trial and error, trial and failure, like repeatedly showing up when you don't feel your best and then at some point experiencing growth or progress and breakthroughs, like you can't, you can teach that, but it has to be through like an actual life experience, um, which I find to be super cool. Yeah, sport is a, is a beautiful microcosm for life. One of the most popular essays I've ever written is called The Zen of Weightlifting. And it takes weightlifting and, um, basically says that, hey, like there's a reason that people can find this this piece and what from the outside looking in looks like a very intense sport, throwing heavy things around. And it is, it's that process of showing up, of learning, especially as one gets pretty good at something that to get 5% better might take a year or two. But that's okay because that's totally. to get five percent better on the scoreboard. But you're you're learning and you're growing and you're becoming so much more like wise as an athlete in that two year period. Um, so yeah, you're not going to have me argue. I, I as a lifelong athlete, I think sport is just such a wonderful um, a wonderful teacher, and it's why I'll have my kids in sports. Um, they choose eventually not to. Obviously, that's fine. But um, I think that it, it really is a good a good teacher. For um, sure. Yeah. So a question that I have for you is, um, so I got an email 
a couple of weeks ago to the to the podcast website, which if you're listening and you ever have questions or curiosities that you'd like to hear discussed on the podcast, um, please please check it out. The website is for the long dot run. There's a form at the bottom there. But anyway, the 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 question that was submitted was an incredibly long question that basically said, okay, you've had 200 plus interviews with professional athletes and high performers, and your conclusion seems to be that process is more important than outcome. Do you think that this is because you're having the conversation with people who are already really good or, you know, they've, they've achieved something and there's some, you know, natural selection in that and that these pro athletes are more predisposed to focus on process versus outcome? Or do you think it's some mix of you know, fo- a focus on outcome, focus on process, et cetera. Um, I have my answer to that, but I'm I'm super curious what 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 your thoughts are. I think it's both and. I think it's a lot easier to riff philosophical on the process once you've achieved some good outcomes. But I also think that once you've achieved those outcomes, you look back and you're like, wow, I wish I would have worried less about the outcome and just focused more on the process. And then that's what you start to do going forward. So I think that the one kind of edit I would have to how this listener frames the really good question is that it's not process or outcome. It's both. It's just where do you put the majority of your energy and your focus? So thinking, worrying, stressing about an outcome is just wasted time and energy. Whereas actually doing the work or sometimes not doing the work, resting, um, that actually moves you closer to your goal. So it's like anytime you start like obsessing about whether or not you're going to fail or succeed at whatever it is you do, whether it's in sport, whether it's in creativity and traditional workplace, ask yourself like, what would be a better use of my time to actually have an impact on that goal? And be comfortable that sometimes the answer is nothing, just to rest. And I'm not an expert on rest and recovery, but I have to imagine that like, resting while stressing out about whether or not you're going to go sub 240 for your marathon is not as good as just resting without stressing out about whether you're going to go sub 240 for your marathon. Um, So choosing a goal, letting that goal motivate you if and when it can, but also being able to detach from it so that you can focus the lion's share of your time, energy, and effort on doing the work itself. An ex- a life example I have that illustrates that to a T is my four-year pursuit of breaking three in the marathon. I tried and failed three or four times before succeeding. And I say fail because I didn't learn from those events. I was like, my first marathon was 335. I was like, I'm not a real runner unless I break three, which is incredibly flawed thinking. Um, and I've it been didn't, there. <laughs> haven't we all? And it didn't take... Uh, it didn't happen until I stood on the start line, as you said, completely detached from the outcome and more just curious about like yeah. how good can I be on this day. And I ran the first 10 miles at 640 pace thinking this is unbelievably effortless and I mm. cannot figure out why. And I crossed the line in 259 and I, I wonder how... I would tell this story if I ran 21 seconds slower. Um, mm-hmm. But the way I get to tell the story is that um, I stood on that start line. I was detached from the outcome and it was a celebration of the last several thousand miles. And then I executed the goal that well, I What was, were your last two miles splits? I can't help but nerd out for a minute. Um, Do you remember? They were just under seven. Um so, so I were feel, you like holding on for dear life to get under three hours at the end of that race? Or was it more like, you know, I can kind of take my foot off the gas a little as to not blow up and still do this? So I ran a 128 first half. And, and then like um, a 131 change second half. Yeah. And so I hit the wall at like 18 and had a tough two miles. And then at 20, I did some mental math. And I, I realized that if I kept every single mile below seven minutes, I would break three. And so I was like, okay, this 10K, I have to do it in this amount of time. Oh, I've done that a million times before. Oh, okay, just run the next mile. And so 
the the process or the 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 tangible thought I had in my head was make it hurt. And so mm-hmm. I had just been getting to know Shalane Flanagan um, mm-hmm. as I was training for this marathon, and we had a chat pr- just prior to the race. It was like a pep talk, basically. And she was like, I never feel more alive than I do when I'm racing. And just think about how you get to challenge yourself and you, you're on that edge of the unknown. So I'm I'm like running in mile 19, mile 20, mile 21. And I'm like, I honestly don't know what's going to happen. And and it's invigorating. And I I want to make this hurt as much as possible because I've come this far and I don't like, I want to take those 20 miles, rewrite the story of slowing down and accelerate. And so my coach was watching the splits. He's like, this never happens. You never hit the wall and then speed up mm-hmm. again. And, and I, and I did that and it was so incredible, but I always reflect on like, okay, but what if I did that and in still went three, did- and went like three <laughs> 15 seconds. Right, exactly. And and then it's like, we have these numbers that are so yeah. arbitrary. Like I PR'd yeah. by, tw- I, by 20 minutes. What if I PR'd by 19 minutes? Like, yeah. would I still be telling the story in this way? So th- that question that I, that I asked you that led to this um, probably 30th time telling the story um, then led to me asking a bunch of pro athletes that I know about their thoughts on that same question. And, and I asked a bunch of Olympians, I asked a bunch of uh, Olympic medalists and, and whatnot. And the two responses that stuck out pretty significantly were almost exactly the same. And they came from two incredibly different people, Kat Bradley and Kate Grace. So 100 mile runner and, and 800, 1500, et cetera, um, specialist. And they both said, Basically, the process is important. You have to be focused on like doing the work and and stress, rest, repeat, and um, and and focused on these like subjective measures of progress and growth. And you need little carrots that are in, that are metrics and outcome driven that inform, but but don't direct. Mm-hmm. And so you're like, fall. it's like the, the it's bumpers. Both ends. Yeah. And it's like the bumper lanes on, on a bowling alley that mm-hmm. like, that's just like giving you guidance of, Oh, nope. You're, you're, you're off to the right a little bit. Oh, nope. Now you're off to the left. Let's get back to center. And I found it so fascinating. Cause I was like, yeah, that is, that is how you describe the importance of, both and cat won western states kate you know has been to the olympics and and had a very successful year last year as well and they both know a thing or two about elite performance and have come uh have experienced not great times as well um so yeah i think it illustrates the point you were making as well which is um again super cool like we have all of these different principles that people are coming to separately whether it's in endurance or in different arenas and we're all saying this similar things just with different ways to explain it yeah and i think that's when you can start to really pay attention and and have some confidence that it's uh it's true with a capital t (laughs) for sure one one of the other hypotheses that i'm curious your thoughts on um so early in the pandemic i started I started doing a lot more um, digital podcasts in this medium. The first 50 were all in person. And so it gave me the ability to like do a lot all at once um, Mm -hmm. and have some notes or have some, some topics that I wanted to get after um, consistently. And so I asked Vanessa Fraser, um, this is March of 2020. She was on Bowerman track club. I asked her fast forward 10 years. What are you really proud of? accomplishing. And her answer was incredibly subjective. She said, I I want to be proud of getting better and the contributions I made to my team and the growth, et cetera. And I was like, "Hmm, that's interesting. I would have expected her to say like winning. Yeah. Like a certain time or ranking or or podium position, what have you. 
Right. And so for the next, like, I don't know, year and a half, I made it a point to ask these types of athletes the same question. And very quickly, I started noticing that so many of these high performing athletes measure true success in a subjective manner, Mm -hmm. which may or may not lead to more, um, like, of what society deems as a conventional success, winning a gold medal, going to the Olympics, et cetera. Is this something that, that you've thought about before? Is it something you've come across? And I'm curious why, oh, yeah. if so, why, why you think it's the case? Yeah, I mean, this is such a big part of my most recent book, uh, The Practice of Groundedness, is just how we can fall into a trap where we think that success is this largely quantifiable, very objective, concrete thing. And um, not realize that actually that thing is just a fleeting moment in time that we may or may not have that much control over. The way that I like to talk about it is even if you do win the gold medal, you're only on the podium for about a minute and a half, two minutes while they do the national anthem. But you spend, if you're lucky, four years maybe 16, you know, four Olympic cycles to finally have the day where it comes together preparing. And if you are going to have your success be contingent on one moment in time, that's going to be super ephemeral. Well, then you better believe that that's going to lead to a lot of anxiety and emptiness and loneliness. Yeah. So I think that those quantifiable outcomes are important in many fields but they are the cart, not the horse. Like the horse has to pull the cart and the horse has got to be, hey, are you growing? Are you forging meaningful relationships? Are you learning? Are you enjoying the totality of this process? And if the answer to those questions are no, then whether or not you achieve the quantifiable thing doesn't really matter Um, because a lot of people have put all their chips in the basket of winning and then they win and um, it's not all that they thought it would be. Here, I, I, I always quote the basketball player, Ray Allen, one of the, the greatest shooters in the history of the game, talking about the day after he won his first championship being one of the most discombobulating, confusing days of his life. Because he's like, well, if this is it, then I'm screwed because like, I thought this was going to change me. I thought this was going to give me peace. Like I thought all these things, he woke up the next day. He's like, now what? Um, and I think that's a really valuable, important lesson, whether it's starting a company, buying a certain kind of watch or car, hitting a bestseller list, hitting 1 million downloads, like, okay, now what, <laughs> you know? And if you get way, and it's not to say we ought not celebrate these moments, we should, but the more attached to them we get, the more disappointed we're going to be whether we succeed or fail. Totally. <laughs> I, so I noticed I crossed a million downloads as I was sitting on the toilet. Scrolling. Oh boy. <laughs> scrolling. Yeah, this uh, is interesting. Scrolling. And I but, was it's like, not, but I think there's also like this moment um, where a lot of people are like, oh, you know, just do the work, do the work, do the work. It doesn't matter. And I call bullshit on that because I think that that, well, that makes for a motivational Instagram post. Like we should celebrate our successes. Like it's fun to 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 win and to accomplish things that you want. Um, we just shouldn't obsess over those things or attach to them. So it's how can we celebrate them and find joy in the wins, but at the same time hold the wins lightly. And then you have to apply the same thing to the losses. How can we learn from the losses and grieve the defeats, but at the same time also hold those a little bit lightly? Yeah, it's like the the saying chop wood carry water. Um, yeah, I think it's the it was, Buddhist approach to excellence. <laughs> exactly. Um, I think it was Scott Fobble that wrote after, I think it must have been his New York City performance. Anyway, he talked about if we don't let, if we don't let negative experiences and results define us, why do we let positive ones? <laughs> And so it's like celebrate it or mourn it and then move on. And yeah, yeah, I've been talking with a few friends about this because like to me, 
again, we talked about the million downloads. Like that feels like a big deal to me. I've been doing this for almost four years now. And I want to like, and I also acknowledge that, you know, Emily Body just crossed 7 million, Jason Fitzgerald, 6 million. And it's not a comparison. It's, it's to say like, there's a whole lot more ahead. This is just the beginning is, is truly how I see it. And it is important to celebrate something that has gone from nothing into in into something, whether it's a podcast, whether it's a book, whether it's you know whatever it is that is your is your medium of creation. Um, but we can't let it define us, especially if we don't let the losses define us. The right. you know the wins can't define us either. They're they're simply metrics or evaluations and and those bumper lanes in the in the bowling alley yeah it keeps the ball going in the right direction or you learn from them right and it literally like course corrects you totally i love that um so more more tangibly what is how does brad define success i define success as living in alignment with my core values it's really that simple for me now, that means like I have to know my values and I have to have some sort of gauge as to whether or not I'm living in alignment with them. Um, but if I'm doing that, then, then I'm successful. That's, that's the 10,000 foot view. Do I have projects with specific goals? Absolutely. But that's all secondary to that 10,000 foot view. What, what makes you the most proud? Right now? Or like ever? I guess it's one and the same. Uh, probably my kid, to be honest, like he's just a great kid. People say how sweet and kind he is. He's young. Um, but, um, yeah, but I'm also not like, it's weird because I, I feel like I haven't put that much work into him. I'm just trying to like let him become. So often the things that we're really proud of are like things that like we really had to like grit for. And with him, it's the opposite. I have to like practice so much restraint to just like let him do his little thing all the time. Um, but I guess I, I, maybe perhaps that's, that's even why I ought to be more proud. So I'd say it's my son. And then I'd say that it's my written work. Um, in particular, my last book, The Practice of Groundedness, I think that's the, it's the best thing I've written to date. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely proud of that, irrespective of you know acclaim and sales numbers and, and anything like that. Um, and then I think it would be um, just that I... I I really try to practice what I preach and walk the walk. I was having a, a conversation with someone earlier today and they're like, man, you know, gonna, gonna do a humble brag here. There aren't too many people that think about excellence the way that you do, but that also like this person knows me, he lives in Nashville. He sees me at the gym all the time. He's like, but also like, you know, just it. like tweeting this stuff. Like you really kind of live it like the lightheartedness, it, the, like the seriousness and the lightheartedness, the outcome and the process. Um, so, yeah, I think that that was it. And, and the context for this was like seeing me like not not perform well at a weightlifting event that like wanted to perform well at. <laughs> it's like, all right, I, I didn't perform well onward. Like I'm a dad, I'm an author. I got all these other things. Well, a lot of other athletes are like crushed. And the same thing when I perform really well, it's like, awesome, I'm going to get like a, a burrito, but I got a burrito when I miss the lift. So like it, it's all, you know, we're all going to die is ultimately what I'm thinking. Um, so yeah, I think, I think those would be, those would be the things. So trying to, trying to really like practice what I preach most of the time, um, my relationship to my son and then also to my partner, those are kind of like, we're a unit. Um, and then my writing. I'm interested. What would you do if I'm like my, my 500 pound deadlift? (laughs) What? What would you do if I would have said my 500 pound deadlift? I would have thrown a wrench in the conversation. Brad, this interview is over. I'm going to expose you on Twitter. (laughs) (laughs) The bots will be coming for you. Oh, they are. Uh, Do you have your Especially with Elon there. (laughs) You have your $20 check mark yet? Fuck, man. I I don't know what's going to happen to Twitter. It's going to be very interesting, but um, I think it's, it's, it's wise to diversify if you're a creator and make sure that you're, you can take your audience with you. Yeah, I uh, your your tweet this morning um, motivated a tweet or two from me as as it off, as yours often do. But uh, my commentary was: if you're not the 
if the product oh yeah, I saw that. Like if you're yeah. what, if you're basically the product. Yeah. What, if, well, what's if, crazy if, is not to talk about social media in our remaining few minutes, but I I called Steve Magnus, my collaborative partner, and I'm just like. You know, I kind of think Elon Musk is just like a narcissistic egomaniac, but the guy has done incredible things. Like, there's got to be something that he and his team see that I don't. But to me, charging the people that create all the content on your platform just seems backwards. And Steve's response is like, nope, I don't think they're smart. I just think they're idiots and that's what they're going to do. Because, <laughs> like, if anything, it would make sense to charge people that use Twitter to read, but that don't produce content. Because they're like using it and advertisers. But to charge the people that are generating the content makes absolutely no sense. And I think that um, they're probably making like a big bet on like ego and status, and people are gonna like wanna feel cool. And I wouldn't pay $2 a month for my blue check mark. Like you can take my blue check mark. <laughs> well, Twitter's not profitable. And so they, they, need, they need money. They need money and they need to figure out how to do that. This episode will be airing on Friday, so perhaps things will change dramatically between now and then. And but yeah, I but, don't know. I think that ultimately Twitter will will maybe maybe if well so here's like if Elon Musk genuinely cares about this platform and he has as much money as he does, I think you have to have a 10 year, 15 year long term view and just let it lose money for 10, 15 years until that long term view can be realized. If he doesn't, then I think they're just going to make catastrophic decisions because um, I think a lot about this because so much of my platform is on Twitter. I think that Twitter is a great like service for a lot of people and almost like a utility, like a public good. At least it can be if the, the trolls and, and conspiracy theorists are, are, are muted or at least dampened. But it's just not a good business model. It's not. Like... When you're when you're on when you're watching a movie and like there's product placement, like you're not gonna unsee the Coca-Cola can. But like even the way advertising works on Twitter, it's like quick scrolling, oh that interests me, I'm gonna pay attention. I can't imagine anyone has ever sold anything from a sponsored tweet. It literally says sponsored and you just ignore it and then move on to the next thing. So it's just not a good business model as it is. But I don't know how they're going to fix it. Maybe they make it subscription based, but then I think it's just going to be a bunch of like journalists and creators talking to each other. Yeah, I mean, I think the future of content is very much or, around subscription. I saw you were yeah. just on uh, uh, an interview for Relay with Lindsay Hine. Um, what they're doing is fascinating. Basically, banking on the one plus one equals three nature of bringing nine creators together who have very different audiences who communicate in very different ways who create very different things and basically pulling it all together for one monthly cost but it's like un and, and, I, and i love Lindsay; she's great um it's like unbundling and bundling so they're like right. basically you unbundle the magazine and like to me you realize just like a magazine but it's a magazine that is podcast, it could be newsletter. And I think that's really interesting. Substack is doing this, the newsletter. Like they're, I think, allowing people to team up more. Um, yeah, but I, I think that I, I do think it's going to go in the direction of subscription based just because I think a lot of these social media platforms, to be quite frank, are either going to have to pay tons of money for content moderation or they're just going to sink to the lowest common denominator. And I think the content moderation is too pricey, even if you are profitable, and they're not. So when does Brad's podcast come out? When does my, my, my own podcast come out? Oh, I don't think yeah. I'll ever do my own podcast. I think the Growth EQ podcast with Steve is funny. <laughs> it's such a fascinating medium and it's growing so much. Um, I started this podcast after listening to a conversation with Mario Frioli and Billy Yang at the end of 2018. And they're ruminating on how many people had podcasts then. And then I just listened to Billy uh, on Cat Bradley's podcast very recently. And he was saying basically the same thing, just gapped by four years. And it's it's such a fascinating um, a, a medium that we can learn from, right? It's, it's no longer just like comedy podcasts. It's no longer just... Um, you know, these, these crime podcasts, it's like, you see what Andrew Huberman is doing. And, I was just going to say, I think Huberman's the ultimate example. And I think that, that, um, 
I wish Huberman would spend more time on the basics. And I have tons of respect for what he's built with that podcast because he's just like, I'm basically going to give like science lectures for two and a half hours. Right. And but, that's but like exactly what he does. At the citizen level, not at the, I'm a, a neuroscientist studying at Stanford right. level. Which yeah, it's, is, it, it, it's neat. I freaking uh, wish Huberman, Huberman, if you're out there listening to this podcast, A, show us some love, give us a retweet. And in B, my man, like, quit smoking and vaping, get vaccinated, like, hit the basics. Because that's my biggest critique of Huberman is he does, like, all these very interesting, like, super niche, like, mechanistic episodes. But then he often doesn't talk about just, like, the, the big things. And maybe because the big things are boring and he assumes that everyone's done them. But I actually don't necessarily think that's true. I bet, like... There's a solid proportion of his audience that could use him educating them on like vaccine safety and the dangers of vaping. Yeah. And what's, again, what's so fascinating about his audience, and I speak to a lot of people who listen to his podcast, both just in my day to day life, but also with what I do for work. And these people will will do anything that he says. It's like that's what I mean, and, and I suspect yeah. that there's a lot of like twenty to forty year old males that like are not vaccinated and use a vape pen. And I think if he like he could extend a lot of lives by by working on those two problems. Totally, I think so much of it is. Um, uh, so many people are fascinated on like the remaining one percent, and they're they've not done the first they missed, 90%. like the first ninety nine. Yep. Yeah. Um, has he's invited you on his podcast, right? No, we've DM'd about it on Twitter a couple of times, but um, it's never it's never worked out. But I would love to go on his podcast. Um, like I said, I don't necessarily agree with like all of his perspectives, and I wish he'd spend more time on the basics. But I, I have a lot of respect for him, and I think that um, he is like his heart's in the right place. He's trying. Yeah, and it's it's fascinating how he. Um how he came into the space so quickly. He was a guest on Joe Rogan, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And all of a sudden he had a platform and an audience and, you know, which is something I think about often. Like if Joe Rogan had me on his podcast, would I go on? Cause I really don't like Joe Rogan. Um, and I don't know the answer to that question. If, if the answer is no, it wouldn't be out of like purity or self-righteousness. It would simply be because like I have a very Jewish sounding last name. And if I say like one wrong thing, that audience could pounce, Pitch which then kind of yeah. is like the whole reason why I don't like him to begin with. Um, so it's like this circle. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a tricky one. Yeah, I, I never thought about it that way. I... I same same challenge for me. I don't think I'm. I don't think I'm being invited on the Joe Rogan me podcast either, anytime worry. soon. But <laughs> um, it's it's a funny thought exercise. But um, for me, but it's, the, the it's bar a, is like anyone that pels it up. Now we're getting like inside baseball podcast. But anyone that pels it up with Alex Jones, I just like have no time for. But it's it's a fascinating um, example of like how how knowledge gets shared now and there's there's some like i don't want to call it gatekeeping but there's some aspect of it's not like tribalism it's not like um i don't know how to say what i'm what i'm thinking but it's like this person unlocks this person unlocks this person and now all all of a sudden the all, all these people have a much bigger platform but it's coming from you know, they're all enabling each other. Again, it's why I like it's why I like this medium so much because you can have people on. And mm -hmm. my goal is I have some hypotheses on performance that um, that are the summary of two hundred plus hours of this type of conversation. And my agenda, quote unquote, is to talk with people who can either. Um, validate those opinions that I have, again, coming from experience with all these people, or add their own flair or say, you're completely wrong. The only person that's basically said you're completely wrong was CJ Albertson. <laughs> and it was a fascinating conversation. And he just trains so differently than everyone else. And he races so differently than everyone else. And it was so fascinating to have this podcast where he was like, no, actually, I don't believe anything that you're saying. <laughs> I'm going to yeah. tell you why. 
<laughs> and that kind of stuff is you learn, you learn a lot from those and your audience probably does too. Totally. Um, what are you working on uh, at the moment? Uh, I have a book coming out next year in September. So September of 2023. And I'm in the process of just finalizing the copy edits before the very long publishing lead time takes over in terms of uh, cover design and publicity and all that stuff. The fun stuff, right? But it is actually the fun stuff for me because my heavy lifting is done once the copy edits are locked in and I've had a chance to review yep. them. Then, then the publisher just shows me cool stuff and I get to give feedback. <laughs> cool. I love that. Um, for those who don't follow you, uh, where can we find you on your corner of the internet, at least as of Halloween? Uh, yeah, the best place, the best place if you're a podcast listener is the, the podcast that I mentioned. I recorded it with um, my collaborator, Steve Magnus. It's called the growth equation podcast. And then um, my Twitter handle is at B Stolberg. And if Twitter awesome. gets really weird, my newsletter you can subscribe to at the Growth Equations website, which is just www.thegrowthequation.com. Very cool. Brad, thank you so much for taking some time to chat. Uh, if you have another moment here, um, trying out a, a fun little uh, this or that segment, uh, if, if you don't mind humoring me on uh Yeah, let on, me just text, let me, let me text my man Steve, because we were about to record our podcast right after this. Sure. And um, one second, I'm going to say, how long is this segment, Jonathan? Two minutes. I'm going to say three minutes. <laughs> Find me time to, to switch over. All right, let's roll. Cool. Phone call or text? Phone call. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Iced or hot? Hot. Uh, black or with milk? With milk. Pets, dogs, or cats? I think I know the answer to this one. Both. Ooh, curveball. Um, running road or trail? I know that the, you've got trail. a lot of options there in Asheville. Yeah. Uh, sprints or long run? Long. Podcast or music? Music, sorry. <laughs> well, this is, a, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, outdoors, uh, hiking or backpacking? How do you, well, that's both, similar. I think, like camping, yeah, similar. camping would similar. be backpacking. Yeah. Um, it depends on the crowd and what's happening, but and both are wonderful. And pizza or tacos? Pizza. Nice. And the last question, place you want to run or race? You know, I'm not actively racing. Since we moved to Asheville, since I have a kid, so much more of it is just hiking now with him in the pack. And... Um, I had a really transformative experience as a young adult in the Nepal Himalaya, and I really want to go back there with my son when he's old enough. Cool. So, so much of what I do is just to try to stay like vibrant and fit enough to be able to sustain a lot of time in the high mountains so that hopefully uh, one day he'll want to and I can go there with him. So That's Nepal awesome. would be the answer. It's it sort of alludes to the Peter Atia um, training. F well, not really, but training for your last decade which is a whole nother. Yeah. Or training for your next decade is how I like to think training about it. Training for your next yeah. decade. I like that. Brad, um, thanks so much. This has been a pleasure. Uh, hopefully we didn't run too long. No, this is perfect, uh, man. Steve. Thank you. Steve's of course. Got no thank organization anyways. <laughs> probably doesn't know recording a podcast now. He's, he's, he's happy to have an extra minute to, uh, to grab a drink. Um, Brad, seriously, thanks for all you do for our sport and for our world in general. Your, um, your books have been uh, incredibly transformational for me personally um, and I'm sure for many others. So thank you for doing what you do and excited to see, see more of it in the future. Thanks my man, be in touch. Of course, all right, bye.